Hi, my name is Chris Taroli. I'm a Parkinson disease specialist at the University of Rochester, and I'm going to talk to you today about the basics of using telemedicine to care for patients with Parkinson disease. Telemedicine is the use of secure video conferencing to see patients remotely, in clinic, at home, at the hospital, or on the go. Telemedicine can increase patient access and convenience by extending care to those who are too far away or too disabled to travel to see a specialist. Today I'll give you some background on telemedicine and help you identify and deploy the resources and tools you need to incorporate this technology into your practice. Patients everywhere can benefit from reliable, convenient access to care, and that benefit begins with you. The first major use of telemedicine in neurology came soon after the approval of TPA. For the first time, we had a therapy for acute stroke, but many hospitals didn't have neurologists, delaying or preventing therapy for patients. Through telemedicine, these hospitals partnered with remote stroke specialists who performed neurological examinations, evaluated imaging, and assisted with treatment decisions. Suddenly, patients everywhere had access. While telemedicine started primarily in acute care, doctors and patients increasingly recognized the value of extending telemedicine into the homes of those with chronic neurological conditions. Now telemedicine is being used to bring back the house call. In the future, telemedicine use will likely continue to expand, both in clinical care and in clinical trials. If telemedicine is something you're considering to expand your clinical care or research portfolio, there are some basic requirements that are important in implementation. This is meant to be a practical guide to telemedicine, so we won't be talking about compensation, as this varies by state. And although the focus of this module is on Parkinson's disease, many of the key points that we'll highlight here are relevant no matter your specialty. Last but not least, this video is meant for educational and training purposes only, and is not medical care. Because of the wide variety of hardware and software available, telemedicine may not be appropriate for your particular practice or situation. Before you can even consider implementing telemedicine, you'll need to select a secure, HIPAA-compliant video conferencing software. While I won't suggest a specific platform today, the University of Rochester has an enterprise-wide license for Zoom, and we've generally found it to be intuitive, easy to use, and suits our needs. All of the examples that I'll be showing today will use Zoom, but I'll try to keep everything as generic as possible to make sure it's applicable, no matter what software you decide to use. Any good video conferencing software should have three basic characteristics. First, it must be HIPAA compliant. Most vendors will say on their website whether their software is HIPAA compliant or not. If they don't say it, chances are they're not. Second, it must be user friendly. Although this is a broad term, some common features can make a program easier to use. The ability to have a login free connection, such as clicking an emailed link, eliminates the need for patients to remember a username or password and can be very useful. A simple layout is also important. For example, if there are only four buttons to click, it's much easier to direct patients to click the right one. Likewise, streamlined navigation is critical. One system may require three clicks to complete a task, like turning on the camera, whereas a more user-friendly system may require only one to do so. The third and final characteristic of a good video conferencing software is cross-platform compatibility. Patients will have a wide variety of devices, smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops, and these devices will have many different operating systems. Software that is universally compatible will allow you to connect with more patients more easily. A fourth characteristic that is useful but not required is a built-in recording capability. Recordings may be valuable in clinical research or could be incorporated into the medical record in clinical care. Now that we've discussed the characteristics of an optimal software platform, let's talk about the human side of things. Most providers who are implementing telemedicine in their workflow will need a staff member to coordinate scheduling and patient orientation. Coordinators and providers should be oriented to the software before the first patient visit. Coordinators should be very comfortable troubleshooting the software and should be generally tech savvy so that they can suggest creative workarounds for unusual problems. Providers should also be comfortable using the system and troubleshooting basic problems to ensure a smooth visit and to avoid patient and provider frustration. A few specific components should be a part of training for every provider and coordinator. Setting up and scheduling visits, starting and ending visits, troubleshooting audio and video problems on various devices, and helping patients to reconnect if they get disconnected. 
So to summarize, by choosing a HIPAA compliant, user-friendly, universally compatible software and providing orientation to providers and coordinators for all relevant portions of the visit, you're already well on your way to the successful integration of telemedicine into your practice. You'll probably get asked though, what does this look like from the patient's perspective? High-speed internet, user-friendly software, and patient orientation prior to a telemedicine visit are essential. With these three things, all patients, even those with limited comfort with technology, can have a successful visit. A coordinator should contact the patient prior to their visit to orient them. The content and duration of the orientation will vary based on the software and device being used, as well as the patient's familiarity with technology. The coordinator should ensure that the patient is comfortable with the software prior to their visit with the provider. Sometimes patients may have multiple devices, say, a laptop and a tablet and two basic rules should be applied in selecting which device to use. First, the device should have a screen large enough for the patient to see the provider well. Smartphones are often too small for this, but if it's all that a patient has, it can certainly be used. Second, the device or camera attached to the device should be portable so that it can be moved for different portions of the assessment, say, carried by a family member to a hallway for a walking assessment and then returned to the desk for the rest of the visit. I've found the tablets are the best devices, given their portability and size, but smartphones, laptops, and desktops with portable cameras are also reasonable options. Desktop with built-in cameras are often suboptimal for evaluating patients with Parkinson's disease via telemedicine because of the inability to move the camera or observe the patient's entire body during the visit. If a patient does need to use a desktop with built-in webcam, the coordinator can assist in optimizing patient position and camera position prior to the visit with the provider. In patients with Parkinson's disease, a provider must assess the speed, fluidity, and quantity of movement in the head, arms, legs, and body. This requires a camera that can observe the majority of a patient's body during the entire visit. Having a sense of global movement outside of the formal neurological examination is often some of the most critical information in the assessment of patients with Parkinson's disease. To facilitate this, patients should be instructed to set up the camera in an open room and in a position that allows the provider to see most of their body during the visit. Additionally, there should be a space nearby where patients can direct the camera to assess walking and posture, two important parts of the Parkinson's disease exam. Family members can help position the camera, Portable devices can be set up on the floor, and patients can be asked to move back from the desk if needed to optimize view of the patient. Stepping back from the details, the most important thing to remember is that telemedicine may be a new and unfamiliar experience for patients. Providers and coordinators should work to provide as much support as needed to make sure patients feel comfortable. Once you've connected with the patient, here are a few key things to remember to make sure your visit goes smoothly. First, treat the visit like any typical office visit. Sure, you might be separated from the patient by hundreds of miles and telemedicine might be new for you, but the same principles of patient care apply. With few exceptions, like assessing rigidity and reflexes, you can perform each of your typical in-clinic assessments and exam techniques over a video connection. Telemedicine may be a new care delivery mechanism, but you're already an expert in the part of the visit that matters most, the content. Second, make sure that both you and the patient are set up properly and everything is working smoothly at the beginning of the visit. This means selecting an appropriate space, adjusting the camera, and answering any remaining questions that the patient may have. Address difficulties early. It'll help avoid surprises later on. Last, don't be afraid to ask a patient to repeat themselves or to repeat a portion of the exam if there are technical difficulties during the visit. Internet connections can be unstable, and this can degrade the video quality. When you're assessing the speed and fluidity of movement in a patient with Parkinson's disease, it's essential you're rating the patient's movement and not the internet connection. If a patient does have repeated internet issues, it may be best for them to move to another room in the house or to another private space with a different internet connection, like a local library study room. Telemedicine can provide an efficient, reliable way to broaden clinical care and conduct research. With good software, a well-trained clinical team, and well-prepared patients, you have the ability to improve the lives of your patients. And at the end of the day, what's better than that?